I Dream of Genie was one of the most groundbreaking, beloved, and commercially successful series to hit the airwaves. Despite the fact the show was incredibly successful in syndication, it also had its fair share of problems. Most notable was the one specific scene that the two leads assumed was responsible for its inevitable cancellation. Keep watching to find out about what this scene was. Borrowing from another bewitching series in 1964, ABC released a sitcom from a fairly captivating premise. It involved a regular blue-blooded American man who lived an unassuming life in the suburbs who has his life turned upside down by a magical woman who lacked a proper understanding of cultural norms. That series, Bewitched, seemed to be onto something and audiences responded enthusiastically. NBC, hoping to cash in on the success of that show, approached esteemed writer and producer Sidney Sheldon and asked him to write a show with a similar premise that might compete with it. From Bewitched to a Brass Bottle Sidney Sheldon knew his new series would need to incorporate some kind of supernatural gimmick, but he wasn't sure what that element would be at first. The same year Bewitched went on the air, a fantasy comedy movie called The Brass Bottle hit theaters. In that film, an architect named Harold Ventimore accidentally released a centuries-old genie from a bottle. After being let out of his metallic prison, the genie tried to please his new master, only to cause a great deal of trouble for him due to his lack of knowledge of social cues and how the modern world functions. Sound familiar? In that movie, the genie was a male, but Sidney Sheldon knew if he tweaked the dynamic just a bit by making her female, it would make the perfect premise for a quirky sitcom. Finding the Right Actress It didn't take Sheldon long to conjure up a pilot script for his new genie series. After finishing his script in a whirlwind writing session, he began looking for the right leading actress. He had a distinct vision for what sort of actress he was looking for. For one thing, he knew he wanted a specific kind of acting style and tone for the character. He wanted her to be both flirty and a bit naive at the same time. Also, he wanted to do his best to avoid audiences and critics comparing his show to Bewitched, so he decided the actress needed to not be blonde. But lo and behold, when he stumbled upon Barbara Eden and realized she was perfect for the part, he had to make at least one concession, because she was about as blonde as they come. As Jeannie, Barbara Eden shined in her role. She stuck with the series for all five seasons and 139 episodes. And for eight episodes, she sported a brunette wig and portrayed Jeannie's evil twin sister, who was somewhat confusingly also named Jeannie. For another two episodes, she also played Jeannie's pitiable mother. Casting Jeannie's Counterpart While it's undeniable that much of I Dream of Jeannie's appeal was due to Eden's incredible fish-out-of-water portrayal of the show's titular character, her portrayal wouldn't have been nearly as spectacular without her male counterpart, NASA astronaut Major Anthony Nelson, played by Larry Hagman. But even though his character was somewhat of a square, Hagman was anything but that. Larry was well known at the time for eagerly embracing the counterculture of the 60s. He was all about sex and rock and roll and had a tendency to drink quite a bit in his leisure time. His drink of choice was bourbon, and it's said that he would sometimes start his morning off by pouring a few shots into his cereal. And whenever he was on set, he could be found with a glass of bubbly in his hand. While he was a bit of a party animal, Hagman's portrayal of Tony Nelson was almost equally vital to the success of the show. But even though he played the role flawlessly, he was evidently pretty confused by his character's on-screen behavior. He couldn't understand why Tony would turn down Jeannie's constant advances. Even so, Hagman was able to portray Tony so well that even years after the show hit the air, audiences still buy into his and Eden's dynamic. This video is brought to you by Magic Spoon. Cereal was a breakfast and snack time staple as a kid but I had to give it up because of all the sugar. With zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving, Magic Spoon has allowed me to enjoy a piece of my childhood again with their healthy cereal options. Plus, there's only 140 calories per serving. No matter your health goals, you need to try Magic Spoon as a low carb, high protein, and zero grams of sugar alternative. Click the link below to get some Magic Spoon cereal today to help you accomplish your health goals in the new year. Grab a variety pack and let us know what your favorite flavor is. Mine is the Frosted. 
And be sure to use promo code FAXVERSE at checkout to get $5 off any order. Or go to magicspoon.com slash FAXVERSE. The scene that cast and crew believe killed the series. One reason audiences couldn't get enough of I Dream of Genie" was the tension and irresistible chemistry between the show's leads. The would-they-or-wouldn't-they dynamic was what gave the show legs. People loved tuning in every week to see if Tony would ever let his guard down, put his career aside for just a moment, and finally give in to Jeannie's feminine wiles. In the fifth season, however, Tony and Jeannie finally walked down the aisle in the 11th episode, thus ending years of sexual tension built up between them. While the network brass thought they were giving audiences what they were pining for, in reality, they had just killed the vibe that made the show so great. Barbara Eden especially hated the plotline, citing a lack of accuracy. She told the Today Show in 2015 it ruined the show. She went on to explain her thoughts on the matter in a bit more depth by reminding us Jeannie wasn't human even though she thought she was. Tony knew full well what she was, so by taking her to the altar like that, Eden thought it broke the show's credibility. Not surprisingly, I Dream of Jeannie was cancelled at the end of the season. The ratings plummeted after the two main characters exchanged vows. Hagman had fully expected this, though, so when he was finally given the news of the cancellation by a security guard on the studio lot, he wasn't particularly shocked. Eden and Hagman weren't the only ones who had been opposed to Tony and Jeannie tying the knot. When NBC exec Mort Werner came up with the idea that the two characters got married, Sidney Sheldon fought the idea tooth and nail. He told Mort the idea would be the death of the show, and told him it would gut the fun out of the series. But even though the cast and crew of I Dream of Jeannie fought to keep the characters from getting married, the network bigwigs wouldn't back down. And just like that, the series that fans had become so attached to in the previous five years had all of its life sucked out of it. Barbara Eden's Career Post Genie After I Dream of Genie got the axe in 1970, Eden went on to star in a pilot for a series called The Barbara Eden Show. Likewise, she appeared in another pilot that never ended up going anywhere for a show called The Toy Game. She appeared in her first TV movie, The Feminist and the Fuzz, in 1971, and that same year she appeared alongside co-star Larry Hagman in the TV film A Howling in the Woods. From there, she starred in several other comedy and family-friendly productions, including 1978's Harper Valley PTA and 1984's Chattanooga Choo Choo. She also continued to appear in highly rated TV films well into the 90s. Eden has also headlined several major resorts and casinos on stage and has put her singing abilities to work by releasing several albums. During the first Persian Gulf War, she traveled to the Middle East with Bob Hope to perform for the troops. Eden has also embarked on numerous national tours, performing in musicals such as The Sound of Music and Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. Always a lover of the theater, she's appeared in stage productions such as Wild Pacific and Night Confidential. In 2011, Eden published her memoir, Genie Out of the Bottle, which debuted at number 14 on the New York Times bestseller list. Today, Barbara Eden lives with her architect and real estate developer husband, John Eicholtz, in Beverly Hills. Major Tony Nelson was played by Larry Hagman. Hagman was born on September 21, 1931, in Fort Worth, Texas. His father was the district attorney, and his mother was the actress Mary Martin. So you could say he had acting in his genes. He went on to study at Bard College and decided to follow in his mother's footsteps and become an actor. He began acting in plays at the Woodstock Playhouse in New York. He became a prominent stage actor, but wanted to make the transition to TV, which was going through a boom in the 50s and 60s. He played a few bit parts on TV shows in the 50s, and even had a few film roles in the 60s, such as in the film Ensign Pulver alongside Jack Nicholson and Failsafe alongside Henry Fonda. In 1965, he was cast as Major Tony Nelson in I Dream of Jeannie, and the rest is history. His performance made him one of the most recognizable faces on American TV. He would continue receiving accolades when he was cast as J.R. in Dallas in the 70s. Larry Hagman passed away in 2012 from acute myeloid leukemia. At his deathbed, actress Linda Gray was by his side. Hey, if you're enjoying this video so far, make sure you give it a like. And subscribe to Facts First if you haven't already. And stick around for more about the I Dream of Genie cast. One of the great supporting characters in I Dream of Jeannie was Roger Healy, played by Bill Daly. Daly was born in Des Moines, Iowa on August 30, 1927. 
He started his entertainment career as a musician, playing bass in a jazz band called Jack and the Beanstalks. He was then drafted into the military and served in the Korean War. After the war, he began taking acting classes. It was in these classes he developed his comic timing and was set to become a noted comic character actor. In the 1960s, he appeared in many comedic sketches for a variety shows hosted by Merv Griffin, Mike Douglas, and Steve Allen. He was then cast as Roger Healy in I Dream of Jeannie in 1965, which became his best-known role. He later played Howard Borden in The Bob Newhart Show, another well-known role. He passed away from natural causes in 2018 at age 91. Another supporting role in the show was Dr. Bellows, played by Hayden Rourke. His mother was actress Margaret Rourke, and he decided to follow in her footsteps. He began much of his career playing small roles in films such as Kim, The Magnificent Yankee, and An American in Paris. He later had bit parts on TV shows such as The Lone Ranger, The Andy Griffith Show, Peter Gunn, and The Beverly Hillbillies, among others. But his best-known role was as Dr. Bellows. In this role, he tried to figure out why Major Tony Nelson was always behaving oddly. Little did he know the good Major was in love with the beautiful Jeannie. After finishing work on I Dream of Jeannie, Hayden Rourke spent much of his later career acting on stage. He died of multiple myeloma at age 76 in 1987. Dr. Bellows was married to Amanda Bellows, who was played by actress Emmeline Henry. She was known for her work in the film Rosemary's Baby and the short-lived TV show I'm Dickens, He's Fenster. But she was best known for her role in I Dream of Jeannie. She had first appeared in the show as a character named Mert in the first season. It was in the second season where she was cast as Amanda Bellows. In this role, she got to show her comedic genius, which made her one of the most loved cast members. The show's creator, Sidney Sheldon, would later remark that Emmeline Henry was easy to work with and a pleasure to work with. Following the cancellation of the show, she had many bit parts on other popular TV shows like The Bob Newhart Show, Green Acres, The Munsters, and Bonanza. Unfortunately, she passed away from a brain tumor at 50 years old in 1979. One of the other great characters on the show was General Martin Peterson. He appeared in the first four seasons and was played by Barton McLean. McLean was born in 1902 in Columbia, South Carolina. He began his acting career early, landing a small role in the silent film The Quarterback. He became known for playing hard-boiled roles in films like The Maltese Falcon and The Treasure of Sierra Madre. He became well-known in westerns as well, including High Sierra and Hell's Outpost. He showed us his comedic skills when he joined the I Dream of Jeannie cast. As General Martin Peterson, he provided some of the biggest laughs on the show. He passed away from pneumonia at age 66 in 1969. A few episodes featuring General Peterson were aired following Barton McLean's death. He'll always be remembered as a versatile actor who managed to play hard-boiled film roles, but who also had impeccable comedic talent. The character of General Peterson was replaced by another character named General Winfield Schaefer. This role was played by actor Vinton Hayworth. Hayworth was born in Washington, D.C. and began his acting career as a teen. He also had a remarkable career in radio. He started working as a radio announcer in the early 20s. He also performed on many radio series such as Archie Andrews and It's Higgins, Sir. His film career began in the 30s with one of his most notable roles in the film China Passage. He played bit parts and recurring roles on a number of different shows. These included Alfred Hitchcock Presents, Gunsmoke, Dennis the Menace, and Dick Tracy. He was cast as General Winfield Schaefer in seasons 5 and 6 of I Dream of Jeannie. He perfectly managed to replace the role of General Peterson and showed off his comedic talents. He died of a heart attack in 1970 at age 63, shortly after finishing work on I Dream of Jeannie. But the star of the show, Barbara Eden, is still with us. Eden was born in 1931 in Tucson, Arizona. She began her acting career in the 50s, playing bit parts and recurring roles on many popular shows. These included sketches on The Johnny Carson Show, and roles on shows such as I Love Lucy, The Virginian, Slattery's People, The Andy Griffith Show, and more. But she became a huge star when she was cast as Jeannie. This role let her show off her acting skills in a lead role. She also became a sex symbol throughout the country. After her work on the show, she's continued to act in film and TV. Her film roles included work in films such as A Private's Affair, Flaming Star, and The Wayward Girl. She also became the spokeswoman for Legs Pantyhose. She was adored for her work in musicals such as The Sound of Music, Annie Get Your Gun, and Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. 
As late as the 90s and early 2000s, she continued to act in films. She wrote her memoir in 2011, where she highlighted her joy of working on I Dream of Jeannie. She continues to make public appearances and loves discussing her time working on the show. She's proven herself to be a versatile actress who's conquered the big screen and the silver screen, but no matter what, we'll always be grateful for her work on I Dream of Jeannie. Number 1. The Tipsy Astronaut We already know Larry Hagman for his iconic role in Dallas playing the greedy, whiskey-swilling J.R. Ewing. But before that, he played the comic but stern astronaut Captain Tony Nelson. Not only was Hagman known for his diva-like behavior on set, he was also letting it go to his head for being the star of the show. Often he would start the day off with drinking champagne and smoking some magical green herbs in the dressing room. While you might not notice his swagger on the show too often, this was one astronaut character that was usually flying high, a feat that even NASA would be impressed with today. By the time he poured himself into the role of J.R. after I Dream of Genie ended, he was already perfect for his demanding character persona. But despite his substance abuse, he always hit his mark when he was in front of the camera. Number 2. A Magical Touch You might not know this, but every episode written for television is prepared beforehand by a scriptwriter. One scriptwriter who often wrote for I Dream of Genie was James S. Henderson. At a time when many Hollywood writers needed the extra money in 1967, Henderson was also writing for another show that was being produced at that time. It seems this writer was also doing scripts for the TV show Bewitched, a conflict of interest that was against the rules and known as double dipping. Though it's not technically illegal, these two shows had such similar plots, some scripts often mirrored each other. By the time the I Dream of Genie producers found out he was moonlighting on their competition show, James was fired without hesitation, but only after he had completed his 35th episode of the series. Number 3. A Series of Rivals Now that you know that I Dream of Genie and Bewitched were two shows that were pinned against each other, they both shared a magical plot. And while Genie had magical powers, Samantha in Bewitched was a witch who also used magic in everyday life. Producers had to be careful how they used Jeannie's powers, so it was decided she would use a series of eye blinks instead of the nose twitch used on Bewitched. Aside from James Henderson, who wrote for both shows, it was a further scandal that both shows were stealing ideas for plots from each other. Oftentimes, there were direct attacks written into the show to make one show appear better than the other. One Genie episode included a chimp being trained as an astronaut, ironically named Sam, which was very similar to Samantha on Bewitched. Number 4. Too Steamy for Genie? You've gotta love how the mid-60s handled romance and flirty situations, since Genie was supposed to be madly in love with Captain Nelson. But the TV network wasn't gonna let romance be too overt, and instead they opted to keep the romantic interludes as tame as possible. This meant even some scenes were filmed intentionally with bedroom doors wide open to visually tell viewers at home no funny stuff was going on. Yet, as ironic as the hippie lifestyle was at that time, in TV land, if things started to become too hot under the collar for Jeannie, she would always find a way to whisk away to her magic bottle. This way, I Dream of Jeannie wouldn't give viewers a feeling that an unmarried astronaut was going to launch his rocket prematurely. After all, it was all squeaky clean fun that wouldn't offend anyone in the conservative 1960s American household. Number 5. JFK Dreams of Jeannie when you think of John F. Kennedy, you're already remembering his infatuation with Marilyn Monroe. Though for Barbara Eden, she was one actor that is always known for her drop-dead looks. Long before her role as Jeannie, she worked in many TV shows as a guest character. In particular, it was in 1957 she appeared in 12 different shows including Gunsmoke, I Love Lucy, Perry Mason, and Father Knows Best. Her hard work wasn't unnoticed since she was usually traveling quite a bit. While at a New York airport, she was approached by a staffer who worked for John F. Kennedy. After being identified, Barbara was asked if she wanted to meet with John long before he became U.S. president. She agreed and was given a personal note with his phone number written on it. To this day, we don't know if Barbara ever called him, but her beauty certainly has the power to work real magic. Number 6. The Real Deal Breaker you might have heard that once you tie the knot in life, the magic is all gone. And in some cases, that can be true. For the final season of I Dream of Jeannie, Barbara Eden learned that the producers decided to allow Jeannie and Captain Nelson to get married. She was furious at the idea and voiced her opinions that it would lead to the end of the show. 
But the producers weren't phased and went ahead with their new plot idea anyway. But to the producers' surprise, the initial season's rating crashed and burned. The show was eventually canceled that same year. It seems that for this seasoned actor, Barbara was right, knowing that people watched the show for the flirty romance and not to see Jeannie lose her powers after the honeymoon was over. Number 7. The NASA Touch Many people think NASA is a bunch of tough military guys who like testing out new rocket-powered weapons. But as we know now, this is far from the truth. NASA actually is more like the cast of Big Bang Theory than anything else. Yet the importance of NASA in the late 60s was all about getting a man to the moon. This meant TV audiences needed to see them as being up for the thrill of adventure and feared the unknown than to ever be seen as pen protector wearing mathematical nerds. You might notice all the astronauts and NASA officials are wearing uniforms that look more military themed than they actually were. Despite this, fans of the show will be happy to know it didn't hurt NASA's reputation at the time one single bit. Do you think NASA should have been shown like military people or as rocket scientists? Press like and tell us your opinion in the comments. Number 8. The Dallas Connection It can be said fans of the original show were sad to see Jeannie get married, but that didn't stop the two stars from getting flirty together on the set of Dallas. Nearly 20 years after I Dream of Jeannie ended, Larry Hagman decided to rekindle the romance and invited Barbara Eden onto the show for five episodes in 1990. As if these came from an alternate universe, these two seemed perfect for each other. And it was a hit with Dallas fans, too, since the audience was teased with the background name of Eden's character on the show. She was finally asked by J.R. for her married name, in which she replied it was Nelson, the same name as Jeannie's final marriage name on I Dream of Jeannie. Number 9. One More Bottle of Magic there's one trademark prop from the I Dream of Jeannie show that everyone knows, but just can't put their finger on it. True fans of the show will already know this one, but for those who don't, it was a bottle that could be bought from any liquor store in 1965. It was actually a bottle that the Jim Beam Whiskey Company had produced for a special Christmas edition decanter earlier in 1964. The producer for the show spotted the bottle in a local liquor store window and knew it was the perfect Jeannie bottle. It was later repainted with a metallic purple and had gold motif lines added. Several of these bottles were used over the five seasons that were produced, but hopefully they poured out the contents before Larry Hagman could get a chance to drink them. Since some of the magic that Jim Beam puts in every one of their bottles can make anything appear out of nowhere. Number 10. The Naval Appeal Unlike the skimpy outfits you see on TV these days, it was a different story for American TV back in 1965. Society was supposed to be very wholesome and respectful, so nothing vulgar or too racy was allowed to be shown on television. This included costume restrictions for Barbara Eden, as most of her costume was similar to a harem girl. But since this kind of outfit was still considered too racy for TV, censors at the time would heavily fine the production if they showed one little body part that was exposed. It seems Barbara's navel needed to be covered for every episode at her waistline. As a result, their genie costume stayed like that until the end of the series. Yet, Barbara got an updated costume in the 80s for the I Dream of Genie TV special. She was finally allowed to expose her navel 15 years later. It seems TV audiences finally grew up by then. Barbara Eden was born in Tucson, Arizona on August 23, 1931. Her parents divorced when she was young, and her mother subsequently moved Barbara out to San Francisco. There, her mother married and had another child. Barbara grew up during the Great Depression, which meant her family couldn't afford many luxuries. Barbara has recalled her mother would sing for her and her half-sibling during the nights for entertainment. Barbara enjoyed singing herself and took up the habit at the local church choir. She stood out amongst the other voices in the choir and was always the one given the solos. Starting during her teenage years, she would make $10 a night performing in local nightclubs, which was a hefty sum of money back then. When Barbara was 16, she began studying acting and singing. In 1951, she was named Miss San Francisco. She went on to appear in TV shows during the 50s and had become a notable film actress by the 60s. But her biggest break didn't come until she got her iconic role on I Dream of Jeannie in 1965. She found out she was pregnant with her first and only child soon after signing her contract to appear on I Dream of Jeannie. She feared she was going to be let go from the show, but the producers ended up deciding to film the first several episodes around the actress's pregnancy. While Barbara was glad at the time for the ability to work, she would go on to deeply regret the fact that her time on the show prevented her from being there as much as she would have liked for her newborn son.
I Dream of Jeannie came on the air in 1965. Barbara had been married to her first husband, Michael Ansara, since 58. Their son was named Matthew. After I Dream of Jeannie came to an end in 1970, Barbara intended to make up for the time she had missed with her son Matthew. However, her husband didn't have stable enough work for this to be a reality. Michael Ansar was a TV actor who never had quite as much success as his wife. In 1971, Barbara became pregnant with a second child. Sadly, her and Michael's economic situation made it necessary for Barbara to continue working through her pregnancy. With few roles being offered to her on television, Barbara was forced to take up with touring productions of various plays, including The Sound of Music and the unsinkable Molly Brown. These productions proved incredibly demanding on the pregnant actress, and her would-be second child was stillborn. After already feeling so much guilt for having to work while Matthew was growing up, her second child being stillborn as a result of her rigorous stage performances pushed Barbara over the edge. She and her first husband's relationship never recovered, and Barbara would never have another child. Barbara and Michael divorced in 1974 after suffering through several years of a deteriorating marriage. Young Matthew was devastated by the divorce. When Barbara married her second husband, Charles Fergert, in 1977, Matthew went to live with his father. When Barbara divorced Charles in 82, Matthew returned to live with her. At that point, he was a young adult exhibiting troubling behaviors. He had a great desire to follow in his parents' footsteps and become an actor, but they discouraged him. Eventually, Barbara relented and gave her son her blessing to pursue acting. But in the early 80s, Matthew developed an addiction to heroin. Apparently, he had told his mother he was attending college. One day, Barbara noticed Matthew had left his books behind while supposedly heading off to class. She took the books to the school Matthew claimed he was attending and found out he was not a registered student. Instead, he had been wasting the days away doing heroin and living off his mother. When Barbara confronted Matthew about his lie, Matthew ended up leaving the house and not coming back. Barbara was unsure where her son was for several months, but it turned out he'd been living on the street. After eventually finding their son, Barbara and Michael managed to convince Matthew to go to rehab. He became clean and resumed living with his mother, but would eventually fall back under the spell of the drug again and again. In 1991, Barbara was married for a third time to an architect and real estate developer named John Eicholtz. When Matthew was 27, things seemed to have turned around for him. He had taken up healthy living and began studying creative writing at UCLA and he became engaged to an accountant, and the two were making plans to have a wedding ceremony in Oregon. Sadly, these plans never came to fruition. Hey, if you're enjoying this video so far, be sure to give it a like, and subscribe to Facts First if you haven't already. Matthew and Sara and his wife were making plans to marry, but Matthew was still secretly addicted to heroin. When it became so rampant that his fiancée couldn't ignore it, she left him. Barbara Eden didn't blame his fiance for leaving him, as Barbara had shut Matthew out of her life time and time again herself. After cycling through periods of addiction for over a decade, his battle with heroin came to a tragic end, when he died on June 27, 2001. At the time, he was preparing for a bodybuilding competition. In addition to acting and creative writing, Matthew had become interested in bodybuilding as an adult. After he was found dead, an autopsy revealed there were steroids in his system, as well as heroin. When Barbara got the news Matthew had been found dead from a heroin overdose, she was shocked. As far as she had known, her son had been clean and sober for two years, and Matthew had once again become engaged to a woman and even planned a ceremony. After Matthew's passing, Barbara was left alone to reflect on the role she had played in how her son turned out. The actress survived her son and is still alive today, and has plenty of regrets about how she raised him. Not only has Barbara never been able to forgive herself for the fact that she wasn't there for Matthew as a newborn because of her work, she also came to regret the fact she hadn't waited to divorce Michael until Matthew was older. Although these regrets often plague Barbara, she's managed to overcome and let go of the past for the most part. Today she's 90 years old and still married to her third husband. She's expressed that it's important for her to move forward and let go of the past, which is part of why she's managed to make it this far in life. And she maintains healthy living habits in her older age, such as a nutritious diet and steady exercise. And although she maintains a healthy diet and tries to get out of the house at least once a day, she isn't above splurging every once in a while. Unlike many other actresses, she is a proud meat eater who can't get enough pork and steak. And she likes to indulge in circus peanuts because she feels doing so brings her back to her childhood. The actress has largely been able to maintain her looks and figure up until today, which is incredibly admirable for an actress who just turned 90. The Bourbon Connection 
1964, the bourbon brand Jim Beam put out what they referred to as a fancy decanter. It was a holiday promotion, and it meant customers could purchase the liquor in a different bottle than its usual square-shaped one. Of course, the folks at Jim Beam knew that the people who drank their bourbon were not very likely to be impressed by a new and fancy bottle, and they said as much in their ad copy, declaring, of course, the guys who know great bourbon aren't going to be impressed by fancy decanters. And yet, Jim Beam released their limited edition bottle for the holiday season, even declaring the move as part of their holiday spirit, since they weren't charging more for it. It was likely a fun way to get some publicity while not losing business from customers who didn't have to pay any additional costs for their usual brand. And it was a successful campaign for Jim Beam. Throughout the 60s, they ran similar promotions with different shaped bottles for the holidays. But the 1964 bottle took on a life of its own when the art department from My Dream of Genie decided its shape would make a perfect prop for a genie's bottle. Window Shopping as the show was in pre-production for the first season, director Gene Nelson was on the lookout for a perfect genie's bottle for the show. One day, as he walked around, he saw the Jim Beam limited edition bottle in the window of a liquor store. And despite it being full of booze, he immediately thought it would be the perfect bottle to store a genie in. He bought the bottle, which retailed at $5.99, and brought it to the show's art department. They got to work removing any trace of Jim Beam and making it look more appropriate for the show. The first season of I Dream of Genie was aired in black and white. As such, the bottle looked somewhat similar to its original form. The glass was smoky and dark brown with some golden ornamental touches. Although it should be noted that any colorful ornamentation wasn't seen on the black and white broadcast. But in 2006, a DVD set of the show came out that showed colorized versions of the first season. And on those DVDs, you could see the golden touches. We're excited to have Tej Hanley as the sponsor of today's video. They've helped me start and maintain my skincare routine by making the entire process uncomplicated. Honestly, it's the best skincare system for any guy who wants healthier skin. I recommend you start with their level one system, which comes with all the basics, including a daily face wash to get rid of the dirt and grime on your skin, a two times per week exfoliating scrub to get rid of dead skin cells, an AM moisturizer with SPF 20, because you should always be protecting your skin from the sun, and a PM moisturizer to help your skin stay hydrated and healthy throughout the night. My favorite part about Tej Hanley is that every box comes with an instruction card that tells you when to use each product, how much to use, and in what order. Their products have made my skin look and feel better than ever, but you don't just have to take my word for it. They have over 5,000 five-star reviews on their website from satisfied customers around the world. In addition to amazing skin, members of Tej Hanley get tons of benefits including at least 20% off the retail price, the ability to customize your box, exclusive monthly deals, pause or cancel at any time, and free U.S. shipping or low-cost shipping to most other countries. And because Tej Hanley is sponsoring today's video, they're offering my viewers a great deal. Just click the first link in the description and you'll get 30% off your first box, plus a free gift. Don't miss out on this amazing deal. Click that link and get started today. Don't forget to check out Tej Hanley by clicking the link in the description of the video. The Bottle Gets Colorized The show moved into the color TV era with its second season, meaning viewers got a much better look at the genie bottle. This, in turn, meant the art department needed to step up their game and make a bottle that befit a genie. They decided to go with purple paint. This bottle was first featured in the episode Genie Genie Who's Got the Genie Part 2 and the newfound pop of purple color made it stand out in the best way. Later on when Genie's sister became a part of the show and was evil, the art department crafted a green version for her. This was to match her green outfit. According to the auction house Julian's Auctions, the show used about a dozen of the limited edition Jim Beam bottles over the course of the show. Their knowledge of the bottles came into play in 2017 as they auctioned off the very first Purple Genie bottle that the show ever used. It had belonged to Gene Nelson, and its authenticity was also signed off on by Barbara Eden herself. The bottle sold for $34,375, not too shabby, considering it was originally purchased for 6 bucks. The year before, another of the bottles reportedly sold for $10,000. Of course, if you want one for your own that wasn't used in the show, you can head to GenieBottles.com and buy one. Now let's do some other fun facts about the show that you might not know. Loathsome Larry 
Larry Hagman was a Hollywood icon and had the ego and bluster to go along with it. Reportedly, he had a very difficult time adjusting to the fact that he wasn't number one on the call sheet, and because of this and other issues, Hagman could be a nightmare on set. In her book, Genie Out of the Bottle, Barbara Eden wrote about his legendary crass and bad behavior. She said that in response to not liking the scripts and having to play second fiddle on the show, Hagman would indulge in copious amounts of booze and drugs. She said he'd show up to work in the morning, already having had a lot of champagne. And then during breaks in filming, he'd head back to his dressing room, where he would down more champagne in between hits of weed. Hagman reportedly indulged like this in an effort to avoid blowing up at people, figuring the effects of the weed and alcohol would help him keep his cool. But it didn't stop him from exhibiting bad behavior. In her memoir, Eden recalled the time he literally peed all over the set. She also said that as she got to know the actor, she could more easily recognize when he was going to be in a horrible mood. That's when she knew not to be around him. Hidden Pregnancy the producers of I Dream of Jeannie were clearly over the moon for Barbara Eden and her performance as Jeannie, because the timing of the first season's filming schedule just happened to overlap with her first pregnancy. Eden actually found out she was pregnant on the same day the network decided to greenlight the show. That meant she and the producers were faced with a difficult choice. Since the character couldn't be pregnant, especially not in the first season, they'd either have to postpone shooting, find a different lead actress, or find clever ways to hide her growing belly. And given how often it happens in Hollywood, it's quite surprising they simply didn't recast the part. It's certainly a testament to how much they felt they needed Eden to play the titular role. And delaying production was a non-starter, so they had to choose the third option, which was to find good ways to hide her tummy. To begin with, Eden generally wore a lot more clothing than she would have otherwise. And of course, there's the old trick of strategically placing props or set furniture so it blocks the audience's view of an actress's belly. They also added extra veils to her costume, prompting Eden to proclaim that they had her looking like a walking tent. Barbara the Lion Tamer Having animals on set is nothing new for Hollywood productions, and these days it's a lot easier to simply add them in via special effects in post-production. But in the early days of Hollywood, they had to do their best to work with wild beasts, and this sometimes meant acting opposite the king of the jungle himself, a lion. When it came time in the first season for an episode featuring a lion, the cast was naturally nervous. Oddly enough, Eden already had experience with a lion on the set of a previous project she'd worked on. In her memoir, she even refers to herself as something of an expert. As such, she was eager to give advice to her co-star Larry Hagman. She told him the trick was to let the lion smell you by standing still in front of it. Then, once the lion has finished smelling you, you lean forward slowly and gently pet him. According to Eden, this makes the lion feel safe and familiar with his human co-star. And as we established, Hagman was likely pretty drunk at this point. And even if he wasn't, he was a pretty disagreeable person on set. According to Eden, he flat out refused, claiming he wasn't about to make friends with an effing lion. So he didn't bond at all with the lion before shoot. And thus, it wasn't all that surprising that when they were about to shoot for the first time and the lion saw Hagman, things didn't go as planned. Since he didn't know Hagman, he let out a huge roar. Hagman and the rest of the crew immediately went running. No one was harmed, but it certainly proved Eden right. The Tough Years Before Becoming the Iconic Genie Barbara Eden was born in Tucson, Arizona in 1931. Motivated by her aspirations to become a singer, Eden studied at San Francisco's City College as well as the San Francisco Conservatory of Music and the Elizabeth Holloway School of Theater. Eden arrived in Hollywood in the 50s. But during one of her first meetings with a casting director, she was told she wasn't beautiful enough to make it in Tinseltown. She was told she was a very nice little girl from San Francisco, but she should go home and marry a boy there. This was quickly followed by being told Hollywood wasn't the town for her. The encounter became more bizarre as the Warner Brothers casting director showed her a photograph of his daughter, using her as an example of what they wanted. Eden was stunned, particularly by the girl's cleavage on display. But she wasn't disheartened. She knew what she was there for. She was there to act. Luck seemed to be on her side, but it's safe to say her talent was the deciding factor. A few years later, Eden was cast in How to Marry a Millionaire. She impressed and was able to display her acting chops, particularly in comedy. Her role featured the most humor of the main characters, even requiring her to perform dramatic physical comedy. I Dream of Jeannie 
Barbara Eden's comedic performance was a great help in being cast in the most influential role of her career. In 1965, Eden was cast as Jeannie in the sitcom I Dream of Jeannie. She played the mythological genie in a bottle who falls in love with an astronaut. In 1964, Bewitched was the number two show on television, and producer Sidney Sheldon was quick to follow its success. Out of this came I Dream of Jeannie, which aired on NBC. Eden had married character actor Michael Ansara, best known as Cochise in the 1956-58 classic TV western Broken Arrow. By the time Eden had been signed to play Jeannie, she was already pregnant and was concerned she would be fired from the series. But instead, the producers decided to shoot around her pregnancy. Eden's chemistry with her co-star Larry Hagman was inspiring, and the show was a tremendous hit. The quirks of the show, including the pink costume, the blink and nod gesture when granting wishes, and the unique concept were all loved by a large and loyal fan base. Many grant the success of the show to Eden's talents, as she shined in every scene she was in. Up until this point, Eden had mostly been cast in supporting roles and romantic interests. Her leading role on the show quickly made her famous around the world, and gave her much that her other roles had not. She played the role of Jeannie for five years, over 139 episodes. She was also featured in eight episodes playing Jeannie's evil sister, where she donned a brunette wig. And she played Jeannie's mother in two episodes, further impressing the show's fan base. Her son Matthew was born about a month before the show premiered, on August 29, 1965. Growing up alongside the show, Matthew developed some resentments towards the sitcom and his mother's beloved character Jeannie. One such incident that sparked his resentful feelings was Eden missing his second birthday due to the need to work. This only escalated as he got older, since he found himself having to share his mother with the rest of the world. Hey, if you're enjoying this video so far, make sure you give it a like and subscribe to Factsverse if you haven't already. And stick around for more about Barbara Eden. Good to her fans. Barbara Eden has been applauded for her warm personality, as she's been notably loving towards her fans. Eden's fan base has supported her since the beginning, and this is not lost on the TV icon. Nobody in or out of the business talks badly about Barbara Eden. She's known for being kind, intelligent, and loving. Whenever she attends an event, her smile is unmistakable. She never refuses an autograph or the opportunity to fold her arms and assume her famous genie pose. Success came at a price. By 1971, her starring role as Jeannie was over, but Eden was filled with joy as she was pregnant with her second child. Despite that, she continued to work. She was involved in touring companies of the unsinkable Molly Brown and The Sound of Music, which were physically exhausting for the star. Eden returned home at seven months pregnant. Tragically, there were complications with the pregnancy, and the child was stillborn. This took an extremely damaging toll on her marriage to Michael Ansara. Eden suffered severe postpartum depression alongside the inescapable guilt, believing that if she'd stayed home during the pregnancy, perhaps the baby could have survived. In some cases, such a tragedy can bring a couple together, but with Eden and Ansara, that was not the case. Their marriage collapsed, and the two of them divorced in 1974. The Loss of Her Son Matthew Eden's first child, Matthew, was in need of direction. In 1984, she became concerned for her son, noticing changes in him like losing weight, being lethargic, and developing a temper. She soon discovered Matthew had not been attending college when he said he was. This quickly escalated into a confrontation, where Matthew left and was not seen for several months. It was later discovered he had been living on the streets and had become addicted to heroin. Eden insisted he enter rehab. After a month, he returned home. He was interested in acting, and despite Eden's concerns, she supported him. They starred together in the 1989 TV movie Your Mother Wears Combat Boots, but Matthew didn't have the same success as his TV icon mom. To Eden's heartbreak, Matthew started using heroin again. She'd followed the advice of professionals and had no choice but to lock him out of her life until he'd acquired the help he needed. Over the next 14 years, Matthew fell in and out of rehab until he appeared to have turned a corner. At 27 years old, things seemed better. He had fallen in love and gotten engaged. He studied creative writing at UCLA and had a job. For about a year, life seemed to be going well, but he fell back into the cycle of heroin once again. His fiancée left him, and he blamed everything on her. 
On June 27, 2001, the body of a man was found in a car at a gas station in Monrovia, about 10 miles east of downtown L.A. It was Matthew, age 35. In the car, police found vials of anabolic steroids, which he had been taking in preparation for an upcoming bodybuilding competition. Blood work revealed there was a high level of heroin in his system. About halfway through Eden's run on I Dream of Jeannie, she spoke in an interview about her son. Quote, The only thing that bothers me is being away from Matthew. There's so little time to spend with a child when you think of how short a time it is before he grows up. Once the show had ended, Eden spoke out further on these thoughts. She explained that even though she'd received offers for shows with three different networks, she was determined to devote herself to family. With only two choices before her, Eden could allow the tragedy to consume her or find the strength within herself to stand up. She chose the latter, stating in her autobiography, quote, I have put one foot in front of the other and carried on as best I can. Such a tragic loss is hard to comprehend, but it's only made Barbara Eden more loved by her fans around the world. Her strong spirit and warm heart is what makes her a true television icon. Two similar premises, two distinct offerings. Bewitched aired on ABC from 1964 to 72. The series starred Elizabeth Montgomery as the witch Samantha. After falling in love with a mortal named Darren Stevens, played first by Dick York and later by Dick Sargent, the two wed and began their lives together as husband and wife. It was during their honeymoon that Samantha revealed to Darren what she truly was. While he was first quite stunned, he recognized she was still the same woman he'd fallen in love with. For the remainder of the series, Darren was forced to contend with the craziness of living with a wife who has an extremely eccentric magical family. He routinely insisted he wanted to live like regular mortals, but unfortunately this was just a pipe dream. Over at ABC's rival network, NBC, I Dream of Jeannie premiered in 1965, a year after Bewitched's debut and ran until 1970. It's undeniable that Bewitched was a significant inspiration for the series, but the show was also based upon a Tony Randall film called The Brass Bottle. In I Dream of Jeannie, Larry Hagman, who you might recall later played J.R. Ewing on Dallas, played astronaut Tony Nelson. After his space capsule landed on a deserted island, Nelson discovered a dusty bottle. While attempting to clean it up a bit, the bottle unleashed a thick cloud of smoke that congealed into the form of Barbara Eden's character, Jeannie. After being freed from the bottle she had spent the previous two millennia stuck in, Jeannie offered herself in servitude to Tony. Being the gentleman he always aspired to be, Nelson rejected this offer after Jeannie magically arranged for their rescue. Tony offered to set Jeannie free, but she instead slipped back into her bottle and stowed away in his backpack as he made his way home back to Cocoa Beach, Florida. Naturally, after the dust settled, Jeannie revealed herself, and what followed was years of whimsical, comedic chaos. Before we tell you more, be sure to give this video a like and subscribe to Factsverse if you haven't already. Who had the better means of channeling their magic? Samantha from Bewitched had two distinct ways of summoning her magic. She would typically either raise both of her arms and speak an incantation, which normally involves some kind of Dr. Susian limerick, or more commonly, she would simply twitch her nose and make things happen without uttering a single word. On I Dream of Jeannie, our lead protagonist, Jeannie, would fold her arms over each other and blink to get things done. In our opinion, Samantha had the superior magical powers. Even if she were to, God forbid, lose her arms in some sort of accident, she could still do her nose twitch trick to make things happen. On the flip side of the coin, if Jeannie were to lose her arms, or even if she were to be blindfolded, she wouldn't be able to do a thing. Even though the odds of these happenings are quite slim, it's still a hypothetical situation that highlights who objectively had the superior powers. Who had the better job, Tony or Darren? Unfortunately, this one is pretty much a given. Samantha's husband, Darren, worked in advertising with a fairly typical desk job. While that career path is certainly admirable, it doesn't hold a candle to the innate coolness of Tony Nelson's job as an astronaut. Sure, Darren was respectable. Everything he set out to do, he approached with virtue. He was a straight shooter who got things done and brought integrity to every campaign he helped develop. But how can that compare to being an astronaut? In the 60s, every kid wanted to grow up to be like Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong. Who had the most meddling boss? Tony Nelson had quite a few superiors he had to answer to at NASA, but the biggest workplace foe he had to contend with was the agency's resident psychiatrist, Dr. Alfred Bellows, played by the late Hayden Rourke. Bellows always suspected something was off about Tony, but every time one of his theories was disproven, he was forced back to the drawing board. Over on Bewitched, Darren's boss at the advertising agency was a man named Larry Tate, played by David White. Larry was always oblivious to Darren's magical personal life, but in one alternate 
reality episode, we did get to see what would happen if he found out about Darren and Samantha's secret. In the episode, Larry witnessed Samantha using her magic. Instead of getting upset or running away, Larry revealed to Darren that with that kind of power, they could take over the world. This was something he apparently had been dreaming of since he was a kid. In this category, we have to say I Dream of Genie takes the cake. We only ever got to see Larry's dark desires one time, but Alfred Bellow's meddling ways proved to be a thorn in Tony Nelson's side throughout the entire show. Which couple had the better relationship? With most sitcoms, the audience ends up growing bored and losing interest after the two leads end up as a couple. But with Bewitched, we got immediately filled in at the outset of the series about how Samantha and Darren met and ended up marrying each other. There was no guessing whether or not they would end up together because they already were together. The rest of the show's emphasis was on them trying to live a normal life together. Over on I Dream of Jeannie, it was revealed that Tony was engaged to someone else in the first episode, but after finding Jeannie in her bottle on the beach and inadvertently bringing her home with him, that pretty much put an end to his engagement. In the early seasons of the show, Tony put up with Jeannie while she was madly devoted to him. Throughout their journey together, Jeannie continued to complicate Tony's life with her magic. She tried to make life easier, but rarely did her actions accomplish this. Through trials and tribulations over the course of the series, Tony realized how much he loved her. By the final season, the two got married. This shifted the dynamic away from Tony being afraid of people seeing Jeannie to him trying to prevent them from witnessing her magical power. Hours. In this category, Bewitched comes out on top as the clear winner. For one thing, I Dream of Genie loses a few points for just how many times Genie referred to Tony as master. This particular element of the series hasn't aged well. Also, Tony was always kind of a jerk to Genie. He spent most of his time merely trying to put up with her, while Darren and Samantha had a loving, albeit non-traditional, and frequently challenging relationship. There was never a question about whether Darren loved his wife. Which show had the better animated intro? In the early episodes of I Dream of Genie, the show opened with a dash of narration and several clips highlighting events from previous episodes. It didn't take long, however, for the show to feature a cartoon opening sequence. Bewitched featured a similar animated intro right out of the gate. Fortunately, both cartoon openings are equally charming, so we give a point to both. At the end of the day, which show is superior really comes down to personal taste. If you were keeping score, Bewitched earned more points in our brief assessment, but even so, it's difficult for us to say which one we like better. Stage rocket, Miss Five. We're gonna have to bring you back. Stand by. This is General Stone. We have an emergency. Stardust One is coming down. Alert the Seventh Fleet. Pipsqueak like you fighting us in court. Just who do you think you are? Drop dead, that's who. All right, Luther, now just calm down. Calm! Calm! Tell me. Yes. Engineering is asking for those new fuel ratios. Haven't you finished yet? Uh, no, sir. I, I was just talking to Major Healy. Oh, let me say hello to him. Yeah. Major? Colonel Peterson here. Oh, good morning, sir. <laughs> All right, thanks for having a last. town behind me and I wore a badge. Great Plains is becoming known as a town where they kill a man every hour on the hour. It's hurt me. I need a steady stream of immigrants to finance the building of the railroad.
Look at that beautiful rug. Beautiful. Oh, Jeannie made it in her weaving class. <laughs> Allow me, dear. You're certainly a lucky man, Colonel Nelson. <laughs> I think so, sir. Last night, we had meatloaf. <laughs> Alfred makes marvelous meatloaf. Summer. Some of you enrolled at Harrod last year, bringing with you the Victorian attitudes of the 1950s, while others among you exemplify the sexual permissiveness of the late 1960s. Now at Harrod... I, I'm the one who just rescued you. If thou had rescued me a thousand years ago, I would have been grateful. But for the last 500 years, I have become angry. How dost thou wish to die? Of old age. <laughs> Jeannie like? Oh, she was, well, just your average everyday run-of-the-mill Jeannie. <laughs> You know I love you. <laughs> Goodbye, Mother. Well, what's up? How would you like to fly to Maryland with me? To Maryland? Do we have a mission? I do. I'm getting married. You're kidding. Yeah. <laughs> No, it's really nice. I, I met Lou Frigno was a good friend of mine, and I met him, and that was kind of nice. So, you remember Lou Frigno, in Incredible Hulk? Yeah, nice guy. In fact, what happened was my age.
prided myself on being tolerant, but... Well, would you explain to me, what is that girl doing here? Uh, well, th that's the explanation. She's not here. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh... Stone Sanitarium. I have a career. I, I, I have a fiance. That one. She's made of ice. She could never make thee happy. For 2,000 years, I've been in that bottle. And then, then this hand released me. Oh, and I saw thy wise face. My son's name is Matthew, Matthew Michael. There's a view from my kitchen, and he would always stand there and say, Mom, that's a great view. I love to just stand here. <laughs> 